Jack is generally one of the most friendly people you'll ever meet, and I and we really encourage you uh, to take some time over the next few days to introduce yourself to Jack and, and talk to her about uh, questions you have with the evaluation or uh, or any any kind of uh, uh, daily routine things that happen with our system. So uh, without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Jackie Atkins. Well, thanks. So, um, just so you know, I am told to make it as long as I want. So, my apologies if anybody has a full blender or wants to make a cup of coffee. Um, so I'm distracted. I didn't hear anything that you said. But, um, yeah, Jackie Atkins, I've been with, I started with American Simmental Association. I was the director of their science and education programs. Um, started there 10 years ago. When our CEO Wade Schaefer took the helm, I um, was hired about a month before that. Uh, so I've been under the Wade Schaefer era, and um, and then grew to have more and more um, involvement in IGS. And in the last I know, year and a half, became the director of IGS operations. And so I'll tell you, I'm not a geneticist. I'm a reproductive physiologist. Uh, but I really care about developing systems that work well for data collection. I really care about the commercial cattle industry and um, applying science to improve the lot of life of those who are trying to pay speed cattle. So we'll go through the values of IGS. But first, I want to take you on this thought exercise. So if you consider a cylinder, and if you're looking on one side of the cylinder and you can't see this round part of it, and you're over here, you might look at that surface and say, that is a blue rectangle. I know that is a blue rectangle. And the person over here staring down the barrel of the cylinder, sorry, so I'm not going to be in the camera with you. <laughs> uh, the person on this side staring down the barrel is saying, it's an orange circle. I know that's an orange circle. And if you're over there saying, what if you're crazy? It's a blue, it's a blue rectangle. And I'm over here saying, you're the one that's nuts. It's an orange circle. And what you have to do is get up and walk around this object to see that it's a cylinder with blue sides and an orange center. So that's an analogy for what we're trying to do here. We're trying to listen, we're trying to learn. If you have questions that you want to share, so that we're all walking around this object to see that it really is a cylinder, not a rectangle, not a circle, but a cylinder. So Luke and I's great Australian adventure of 2023. Again, I've never been to Australia, never seen the opera house. So cool to see it up close and personal. Um, so we spent a day in Sydney and then quickly hop on the train to Laga and have been loving um, our trip. Learning new vocabulary, jackaroo, you call those cowboys. <laughs> uh, crush, it's a shoot. Race is an alleyway. So there's all kinds of new words that we're, we're learning about. A stud for us in the US, a stud is a semen company. Company that's selling frozen semen on the islands. Obviously, that's not a stud in Australia. A stud is a breeder, a seed stock breeder. Draft. For us, a draft is like a football term. Somebody gets drafted out of college football, which there's another one. Football is <laughs> a different cost than it is to you. Um, and we're drafting cattle, we're sorting cattle, to be the term we use. Um, join, we call that mating. There's all kinds of terminology that we're learning about mods, muster, station. Those all mean very different things in my head, but I'm learning as I go. Thanks to Graham and Kylie and others on our tour. We've been exposed to really fun and exciting food, octopus. Maybe not octopus before. Um, espresso. I've never gone to wholesale. Where's Tom? Tom and Andrew? They had an espresso machine at their wholesale. That was like, I could do this flat white. Yeah, let's go. 
Um, can't see what we meet. Hi, yeah, that was wonderful. And Jason and Kylie. I don't know if that's how you spell Gabby. <laughs> but we Gabby yeah, on their beautiful, huge table outside on their porch. Lovely. And happy convention night twice. First time I was not so bueno, but um second time it was mixed in with butter. It's really good actually. So I'm learning. There's all kinds of things to like sort of smaller disorienting things for me like Luke and I don't know which way to look when we're crossing a road and cars are coming from a different direction than they are because you drive on a different side of the road. The sun is not quite the right spot in the sky for me. Um you have kangaroos here's a little kangaroo that might be hard to see that was a big goal of ours when we were um, driving around to find some kangaroos that was up in the Kansas. Uh, it's a different time of day for me back home. It's a different day. We're six hours ahead and a day behind back in Montana. Um, we are in winter right now. This is my nephew. It was 27 below, something great. Uh, two days before I got on the plane here. So that's my nephew, Ian, out doing chores. <laughs> I swear he can open his eyes. <clears throat> you guys have some from a catalog aspect. You have some different things that you're facing than we are. Certainly the droughts that you have are pretty epic. We we have droughts. I'm not sure they're Australian droughts. Um your grading system is a little different. We had a we had a nice long tutorial about the uh Australian grading system yesterday was very, very fascinating. Export markets are a big deal to you. They're important to us too. Not quite to the level that they are for you guys. We have mandatory ID. We have, like, we have a lot of people that ID, and you know, a lot of people who take it seriously. But you have mandatory ID. You have an ability to tie a carcass record back to the cow calf operation. That's a huge opportunity in Australia that's a lot harder for us to come back in. Okay, but we have a lot in common. And what I think is cattle nerds are just kind of cattle nerds. People who are passionate about cattle, there's a lot in common, whether or not you're in Australia or Brazil or the US or Canada. We share a lot of the same passions and enthusiasms. So it's been really fascinating to meet the cattle herds of Australia. So what's IGS about? IGS exists to provide simple and effective genetic tools to serve the beef business using cutting edge science and collaboration. The commercial cattle industry is at our heart. That is why we're doing the things that we do. When this gentleman is out there looking to drive, I'm learning, he's out there looking to draft, we want him to have the best information to make that decision. But because we care about this next generation, we want this next generation to have an opportunity to come home. And if that business isn't profitable or successful, it's going to be pretty tough for those folks to come home. Oops. The IGS culture is pretty unique. I would say this might be, I would say it's one of our best strengths. We care a lot about the science. We care a lot about the commercial development, but we don't do that in a competitive way. So the IGS culture fosters industry partnerships with diverse perspectives and organizations while honoring autonomy of the individuals in the groups. So here's a little story. These are my three twerps. It's another difference maybe in pairs. Like I'm missing my kids, but I'm also like able to be fully present because I'm going to have to keep these three little kids um, on the straight and narrow. So these are my girls. This is uh whoops, Hazel. 
and Ada and Greta. Hazel's 11, and Ada's 8, and Greta's 6. So um, getting them to bed hasn't always been like the easiest, most peaceful time in our household. Sometimes getting to the, them to bed, ready for bed, brush their floss, their PJs on, they're ready for the next day has been kind of painful. And it's on work every single night. And I thought, you know what would make this fun? Let's make a competition, right? Let's compete. You guys ready to go? Three, two, one, who can do this the best? I thought I was going off to something with this concept. So I set this up three, two, one. I'm going to write to do. Who can do this the fastest? You know what they did? They were like elbowing each other out of the way. They blocked the bathroom because they didn't want the other one to get the toothbrush and their floss. It turned into a disaster. It was not a way of making it fun and peaceful. It just turned into this like little World War III in my house. It happened faster. It was not better for the goal that we were trying to achieve and made it worse. So what I learned was, okay, this is not working for me. How about the goal is if we can all get ready in 15 minutes, we're going to come down here and we're going to read Harry Potter for 40 minutes. And that totally changed things. Now that Hazel, the 11-year-old, is helping the six-year-old get her stuff. Right, so instead of being competitive and needing to be the first one, and I'm not going to help you out because it's about me, we need to be working together. And that is very much what IGS is about. It is not industry standard for different breed societies to work together. That's not what they do. They're competitive, so I'm going to keep that first. But what we're seeing at IGS is getting the three societies to work together has very positive impact on what we can do from a genetic prediction standpoint. So IGS is very collaborative. We have a genuine, like Kelly was talking about, we have monthly meetings with all of the breed societies that are in IGS. They're, they're downright friends. They're good friends of ours. Um, we care deeply about the success of the individual uh, breed societies in IGS. It's very inclusive. It's not like you have to be this size or this breed or this color or this anything. If you believe in the commercial cattle industry and you want to do what's right for them, come on in. We'd love to have you. And yet we honor the agency or the autonomy of the individual breed associations. We are not heavy handed. So here's the things that we can provide you. Here's the predictions that we can provide you. It's up to each individual association or society to publish what they're comfortable publishing. It's up to the individual society to uh, maybe develop a different index. If there's a different index that would fit your system, that just because we're not providing it doesn't mean you can't pursue it. It's really important to maintain the autonomy of the individual breed societies. Okay, so here's our collaboration. There's 20 organizations involved. Um, I'm not going to read all of these off to you, but I will point out short B. Australia was the first society to come aboard from Australia with us. We certainly worked directly with some of the um, studs in Australia. Uh, in, um, there's avenues to the American Hall Association for people to come through directly through those, uh, but we definitely want to expand or provide service to societies that make sense in Australia. In um, Semital, Australia, just recently came on board. I don't have the um, Australian Healthy Group up here yet. They are interested and they are working on coming on IGS through the American Healthy Association. Uh, but we don't have their name yet, so I don't have them. We've got some other groups that are testing. Of note is the performance state breeders who will hear from later today on the agenda. And New Zealand Simitol is the first to come through with New Zealand. 
And when I think about this collaboration and think about not just working with these individual funding organizations, I think about the breeders of them that were helping to service and their commercial customers. We've got a really big footprint between all these different groups. We have the largest genetic evaluation on the planet. There are 22 million animal records in our genetic evaluation, and there's 500,000 genomes. And we do it differently than other groups that provide um, genetic services to multiple different breeds. This all goes into one genetic evaluation. So if we look at this top line up here, these are all the records going into IGS per um, birth year of the animal down here. So from 2011 to 2020, these are the animals entering into the genetic evaluation. And down here, it's not important to know who belongs to which line, but these are the individual data sources submitting um, records to IGS. And the point of this graph is some of these lines, these are big groups. They've got millions of animals in their databases. Every one of these lines is morphed when we look at the collaborative effort, when we look at the total effort coming into IGS from all these different data sources. Not really has power, because more data means we do a better job of predicting the genetics. And you could argue, well, if they're not really connected, if those little lines in the bottom aren't really connected, then it's really not that beneficial, but they are. So we have 19 data spaces sending data into IGS. We have four bowls who show up in 17 of the 19 databases. That's a very connected database. They add those four bowls alone have almost 20,000 progeny across those 17 different databases. A third of the animals, a third of those 22 million animals, have a hexid in a separate database. So they're very, very connected. So that means that we do adding all that information in one genetic evaluation means we do a better job of predicting more genetics. Oops, I had one more slide in there, but so um, we have looked at, um, for instance, uh, short form feed. By coming into IGS, we add just over 100,000 records to the short form feed database that are from that are connected to short form feed genetics that are in other breed associations in IGS. Same is true for um, Simitol Australia. I think we add about maybe a million. I don't remember what the numbers are for this week, but we have a lot of records to both of those um, evaluations. I get excited about this slide. So our science team is going to be cranking away on genetic improvements and new statistical models, and new software, and all of that is very, very important. What can the studs do? I can change that on this slide. What can the studs do? What can the breed societies do to help paint more accurate genetic predictions? And the reason why I get excited about that is that, that is step one. If we don't have good data going into the genetic evaluation, I don't care how good your science is, we're not going to do very much with it. So a big part of the accuracy of the genetic predictions lands on the shoulders of the people in this room. And those that you know just like you. It lands on the shoulders of the studs. It lands on the shoulders of the breed societies to build the programs to dangle carrots in front of people to send the kind of data that we want. So what can you do? Whole herd reporting is important to us. It does two things. Whole herd reporting by having all the cows on an inventory system, we start to better predict the female traits. And those female traits are pretty important but we need to have an assessment of who all the females are and whether or not they have a gap for you. And so setting up these whole herd reportings really lends itself to that. 
The other thing that it does is it also really um, sets up a stage to make full um, contemporary group recording with the calves out of those females a lot easier. We want accurate contemporary group definitions if calves are in a different environment to grow in or get fed in or marble in. We want to know that they're different. If they're head to head comparable, that's great. Uh, but we want the contemporary groups to be accurate. Otherwise, you can't get those genetic skins and so it's very well. Uh, we want records on the entire contemporary group. So what happens, I don't know if this is an American thing, I don't know if it happens in Australia, Bill, you might be able to tell me. We see people who get, I don't know if it's like a fight thing where they only want to tell you about the good ones or if it's a shame thing, like they don't want to let you know about the bad ones or maybe it's both. But we'll have people, if they have a hundred calves, they'll only tell, send you the 10 best. Well, what happens with that is if we only know about the 10 best, we don't know that they're the 10 best, right? We have to have the entire pack group to be able to pick out this. Yeah, you're right, those are the 10 best. So we're working with computers and the computer only knows what you tell it. So you have to send in records on those entire contemporary groups in order for us to really assess the genetics of it. We also want more rare records, later in life records, mature weights and carcass records. And so that's the point of this graph is, so this top line, this is IGS data counts in the year 2022. So the top line is the pedigree file. So we have that many animals basically in the genetic valuation. And then the next level down is how many birth weight records we have and how many meaning weight records we have. So we still have a lot of birth weight and meaning weights. We drop pretty sizably when it comes to yearly weights. Actually drop when it comes to cavernia scores, docility, ultrasound fat, genomics, and actual carcass records. So what you can see is we clearly have a lot of meaning weights or birth weights. But when we start getting to those later in life records, it gets pretty small. And this is not a problem with the IGS genetic evaluation. This is a problem with all genetic evaluations. So anything we can do to try and grow these more rare records is a real positive thing. And that's not just positive for you, that's positive for the entire system. Um, and you'll hear later on today from Lane Geist, who has done a great job of running some of these systems trying to aim at widening these bars down here in the bottom of the graph. So um, going back, this is again the, the list of the IGS partners and their members and their commercial herds that they're servicing. When I get excited about this list, it's because I think, well, I like these people. But also, when I'm thinking about how do we widen these, um, how do we get more of these later records? It's not just Luke and I are going to do it on ourselves. When we've got this collective group who's working on it, then we can really make a difference. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. So here's an example. This is how that same graph changed from 2021 to 2022. So we grew our pedigree, we grew our growth at 5%, but look, we're growing these later in life records faster than we're growing the growth or the pedigree. And when, when we look at the carcass records, we grew that by 120%. That's exciting to me. And a lot of this growth didn't come, it came from, an IGS partner that we have in the US that was getting a lot of beef on dairy records. And we found ways to make that beef on dairy information useful in a genetic evaluation. And we're able to over double the carcass records in the system. Okay, and finally, at, a at IGS, the unending pursuit of truth and facts in greater service to the beef industry at large 
takes precedence over the interests of any group, given group or organization. So let's talk about unending pursuit of truth for a bit. I love this book. Where's it? Where'd he go? The grammar finally hiding. Oh man, this is their big reveal. <laughs> um, any observant local knows more than any visiting scientist, always no exception. We recognize that Luke and I are Americans. We don't know everything about the Australian system. We recognize that as a one. And we want to service your country. We want to service the commercial cattle industry of Australia and the folks that are supplying the genetics going into that. So this is a real key relationship for us. So Graham and Kylie have the Australian Genetic Solutions. And part of that business is to help us better understand opportunities in Australia, service our Australia friends and societies and studs and commercial operations, and look for more opportunities to, you know, figure out if we can get some more carcass records from in Australia, for instance. It's really sad that I'm looking for this one. <laughs> They're probably happier. They'd be embarrassed. Um, okay, so here's our science team. I won't belabor the names on this team. Uh, we have a group that meets weekly that just makes sure the projects we're working on are you know, getting steps made in the right direction. We have a team of kind of growth and innovators. Um, Chip Kemp, who's been here a couple of times. Luke is our key international business. Uh, person and then uh, Graham and Kylie and Mel. IPS is a little bit like trying to land a man on the moon. There's no instruction manual for family of 22 million animals who are crossbred and multi breed and from all these different um, parts of the world. And so we rely on a lot of different scientists to help us figure this out. I would say a key relationship for us. They're all key, but um, Dr. Doreen Garrick and Dr. Daniel Garrick, it's interesting, hey, we're trying to land man on the moon, right? Well, Dan is a rocket scientist, so we've got a rocket scientist consulting us. Um, but they develop famous solutions. They develop the software that we use called Bold, um, along with Dr. Bruce Bolden. And uh, they're just real key consultants. And, um, helping us go in the right direction. Okay, and so we're in unending pursuit of the truth and service to the beef industry at large. That takes precedent over the interest of any given group or organization. So one of the things there's a, um, there's a um, study called Positive Psychology and it's the study of how do people flourish? Like not just, a lot of psychology has been trying to help people who, who have um, mental health problems, who have depression or anxiety, but what are people doing who are flourishing? Let's also study how people are getting this, you know, right. And one of the keys to flourishing is having meaningful work, doing something meaningful with your life. And doing something meaningful usually means not just taking care of yourself, maybe not just taking care of your company, but servicing something bigger than that. And I think IGS does this really well. So the meaning of IGS, the thing that we're servicing is genetic improvement of the commercial beef cattle industry. And that mission of IGS is bigger than any single breed society it's bigger than the seed stock industry. It's bigger than any single country's commercial sector, right? We are a global group, um, and that's important. Having this kind of philosophy really helps us stay the course. It helps us maintain our integrity. If we're looking at projects that would be a good solution for this society, but it's not good for the commercial capital industry, we're out. Whoops. 
All right, so we'll just bring it back to the cylinder, and I um, am looking forward to continuing to walk around the cylinder in Australia and hope you walk around it with me. That's it. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, while we've got Jackie here, we're gonna we're gonna take a uh, morning tea here in just a second. But does anyone have any questions for Dr. Adams? Thank you, Jackie. Um, Felicity, it's Michelle. Um, you were just talking about the NLS, the ID, mm -hmm. and getting carcass data. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a way forward that we can link those things back to size? somehow to improve because that is an yep. issue that we are having. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so can we link it back to ciders? So I'll give you an example of something that's worked for us in the past. Instead of thinking, I don't know, maybe there's an opportunity to get three million carcass records from this one um, cabin bar. Well, can we make all three million work? Probably not. But is there a portion of those that we can link back to Sire? And if so, let's figure that part out. So I think it's more of a, um, <laughs> we beat our head against the wall trying to figure out how to increase carcass records. And it was always from the front end. Like how do, how do we get more commercial operations to use zone sires and how do we, how do we build it from the cow calf sector up to carcass? And what we realized is we need to work from the back end and say, here's where we can get carcass data. Now this carcass data, what can be used in the genetic valuation? So maybe it's not 3 million, maybe it's 100,000, maybe it's a fraction of those, but to get to add another 100,000 carcass records, that'd be amazing. And to, especially on the multi breed that that's what I would say is we have breeds that send in carcass records and IGS and we're super super thankful we have breeds that have zero so how do we get those breeds with zero some carcass records um so I think the opportunity is there it's just we have to find of the records that exist how many that is minimum requirements that we need to get into a genetic valuation, and one of those minimums is we have to tie it to a pedigree. Um, we're also looking into, and this is, well, it's in way, way pilot stage, but in a DNA sample, tell us what we need. So maybe we're not figuring out multi-sided groups and things like that, but with a DNA sample, can we get close? We start to tie into pedigrees on that. So good question. Yeah. Um, Jackie Bill Corner, years of more genetics and simmental. Um Jackie, the simmentals and answers which we run a young carcass program, mm -hmm. uh, which included commodity breeds. Um, is that still running? Can you just expand on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I don't want to steal things thunder because rain is coming up and he's going to talk about it. But what I'll tell you is so American Cemetery Association has two carcass programs, one called Carcass um, Merit Program, and that's like the traditional young sire test where bulls are denominated and we find herds that will breed to them and then they track them over through harvest. The other is doing what we were just talking about. It's called the Carcass Expansion Program. And so instead of starting at at the joinings and working your way up to carcass, we're saying, okay, who's got carcass data? How can we use it? And so the carcass expansion, we trade, we DNA test the calf in return for carcass um, data. And I'm sure Lane will talk more about that. But yeah, and we try and make those as multi breed as possible. The reality is they come through the American Semitol Association, so most people are somehow tied to Semitol. I would say Angus is pretty well represented in those genetics, and that Angus would be moderately represented. We even like we had a new bowl or two in there a couple years ago, so we get some other breeds. Um, but 
but I, I don't know, maybe there's some opportunity to build a truly multi group purpose test program. The problem with the purpose test program is um, a lot of resources go into developing that. And at the end of the day, you might not have a purpose record. So instead, if you can work back from we know we're getting purpose records, can we make them useful in a way that prevents that big, giant, expensive dropout? Yeah, Jamie Scott, you're here. Um, we all know data isn't data that makes sense. Like some data is worth heaps and some data is worth very little. Mm -hmm. How do you guys or the computer work out what data is worth keeping and what data you can have? Like a million bits of data, the weights, but if they're only weighted in all separate groups, then it's worthless. Like, how does the system work out what's good to keep and what's Throw away hmm, that's a good question. So, and I'll also put a plug in for a later talk, which will be Ryan Bolt, who's our lead geneticist, and he's going to talk about some of our new trade developments. Um, I would say contemporary groups is a great place to start. So, figuring out how the, how the animals compete within that contemporary group are really important to us. Um, if it's a separate contemporary group, then <laughs> we don't know what opportunity that animal had to get pregnant versus this animal. Um, though I'm not sure if you're referring to the birth weight. We have a birth weight sensor that if all the calves are reported as weighing 38 kilos, our sensor says that doesn't seem right and it picks it out. Um, if there, if all the calves look to be a pretty um, biological variation, but they're there's rounding or something like that, then we can adjust the heritability really related to that data so that it doesn't have as big of an impact on um, the evaluation. So I'm not sure if either one of those answered your questions, but yeah. Yeah, well, it's more about what well, I know. Ruth may not tell you that they believe that. Half their birth weights are just not writing the kind of page. Yeah. And like I said, they either have the bit between 42 or yeah. whatever the scale yeah. is. The, the, like, the chances of that happening is very unlikely. Right. There's got to be some sort of filter on yeah. those sort of things. And probably the other side was with the carcass, like straight out of mm -hmm. fire type, is um, I know. The breed plan was very strict on what they would allow, what they they wouldn't allow in the they couldn't track. Um, so like contemporary breeds, I suppose. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering about things. Like you can say you have plenty of new pieces of data and follow, but how much of it is actually worth like worth something, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Well, we I would say we feel like it's all valuable. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, but absolutely. Like if you're developing a program and think, boy, we could put money towards more whole contemporary group weight reporting, or we could put money and efforts towards getting markets records. Let's put the efforts towards the markets records. Um, but that also might be specific to different societies. Um, but yeah, we do have a filter that it's using it's kind of scientific, it's deep neural networking, and it's machine learning that we pick up and we pattern it across herds that we knew their behavior, and it can pick up those that, but, well, Jason showed us his scale, um, his, how he collects um, birth weights at his place. That's really nifty. What we end up seeing is people who've got all four backs in and they don't have a link to scale like that, it hurts them. So they can do hoof takes. And we've got a way of using those hoof take measurements for, for rights. But if, if there's a lot of rounding or if it's, there's flat out no variation, then the machine picks up on it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the coefficient of inbreeding get significant in your assignment? Ooh, well, um, not something I'm maybe ready to answer. I would say we have a lot of, it's not a terrible problem, but you would maybe want to look at it within a population or within a certain set of cattle because, because we are a, a multi breed um, organization. I would say we have, like, so for American Semitol, for instance, more than half of the animals registered in American Semitol Association are crossbred. Of the registered animals, they're crossbred. So there's um, it helps with concerns around inbreeding. Uh, so I don't, I'm, I'm not, I probably can't answer that for you, but um, something that we could look into. But I would say just the nature of how we built this system to be crossbred friendly, um, it's not a big concern. But maybe there's populations that we should look at closer. Do you have concerns? Uh, not a particular concern, just okay. in the broad sense, the whole family is really down to about 12 families. Right. Uh, we have a greater increase of the database with the dairy beef on the market. Yeah. Is that showing up? Yeah. Well, and, you know, um, I think because, I mean, AI is certainly used, it's not used nearly as heavily as it's in, in the dairy industry. Um, we have a lot of people working hard to find out crosses, and I think that still exists, and it's still, you can find them just because of how the beef industry is structured differently than the dairy industry. It's not all AI breads that you're really zeroing in on these smaller grains of animals. There's a lot more, you know, natural service players and things like that. And again, because it's many different breed groups from all over you know, US and Canada and Australia, um, there's a lot of diverse population in the, represented there. You look like you have a response to it. Don't um, okay. <laughs> Other questions for Dr. Atkins? Yeah, Dave, that's my answer. This is a loaded question. Um, I was just wondering, sort of, why do the like, animal societies right around the world have jumped on the idea? And why do you think that they haven't done that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you said it's not, right? Um, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't know. I think they have a system that works for them, you know, and the door is open, you know. The population is massive. Yeah. 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 And to be clear, we get the Canadian Angus. They're part of us. Um, Fat Angus is part of us. Um, the, the four bulls that show up in 17 breed societies. Yes, what breed they are. They're Angus. So we get a lot of Angus genetics in here. Um, but will the Angus society come on board? And, you know, like I said, doors open, but they have a system that works for them. And, you know, so as long as that's working, maybe we'll just kind of keep trucking with that system. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to have them. Yeah. But the other thing is, Um, just having more interactions with them is really good. Having a better understanding, for them to have a better understanding of our system, we must have a better understanding of their system. And we're really not trying to be sharks and come in and um, absorb your group. That's not how we operate. So maybe instead of, you know, like they talk about parallel play for toddlers, like maybe we're not exactly sharing toys, but we're sitting next to each other and with each other, you know? And and I think that's maybe the, I'm happy with that. Thanks for the not loaded question. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Jackie will be available as we take morning tea. Real quick, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, time and being here. Here's a small gift. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you.